This is top America. This is crazy. Like, Everybody knows that the United States is the most litigious country in the world thanks to our overabundance of frivolous lawsuit. Not ah, uh, I'm clearly not American. Look at the way I speak. <laughs> Kevin, who wrote today's script, is American. And he knows all about lawsuits. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. It's just because he's American, not because he's been involved with many lawsuits. I'm sorry, we'll carry on. This stems from the fact that there isn't any punishment in the US for filing frivolous lawsuits, so greedy individuals are more than happy to keep throwing the dice in the hopes that one of their ridiculous claims will eventually result in a large cash settlement. Well, there is a bit of punishment that can happen, right? You want the ultimate punishment? Mm, yeah. Because they can sue you for fees. So if someone frivolously sues you, and then you have to go to court and defend yourself, and you pay your lawyer, and then they're like, the judge is like, what are you f***ing talking about? This is thrown out. And you spent like thousands of dollars on lawyers. You can then sue the person who tried to sue you to get those lawyers' fees back. And you probably will, I feel if it was truly frivolous. And despite the fact that everything I just told you almost certainly lines up with your perception of the US legal system, it is entirely false. The United States is number one in the world in a lot of things. We have the most guns per capita, the most celebrities turned politicians, and the most importantly, the most freedom of any country in the world, America. Unless you're a woman or part of the LGBT community. <laughs> But hey, at least corporations and frozen embryos get to enjoy all the same rights and freedoms as us straight white men. And in the case that that news didn't make it all the way to Prague, Simon, Alabama recently ruled that frozen embryos count as people. Oh, it did make it all the way. This is like, like what the? F it's a frozen embryo. It's not a f person. It turns out you don't get a soul till you're like one. You're maybe six months. I forget. Like wherever you sit on that, I mean. Of course, if you sit, like, right on the, like, all life is life people thing. Like, everything living has a soul. Even spinach. It's just nuts. Like, <laughs> be against abortion or, I mean, past a certain point. Well, we're getting really tricky here. But, like, embryos, my dudes? Really? Embryos? <laughs> Just before we continue with today's video, let me give a big shout out to our fantastic sponsors there. And that, of course, regular friend of the show, Vessi, who let me do whatever I want in the ad reads. There are, they just gave up on giving me talking points because I just went off on them. And you guys seem to bite these shoes when I mention them, which is very nice of you. It supports me. It supports the show. And also, you get amazing footwear. Woo! Uh, Vessi, what's up? Um, spring is sort of around the corner, so I seem to have chosen completely the wrong pairs of shoes. Uh, what's the, these ones? Like, it's even been nice recently. So I'm wearing their boardwalks, like, uh, kind of these days, instead of these which I was wearing. More wintry, definitely more wintry. They got the big, like, fur up there, although these shoes are always vegan, so it feels very good. I'm not sure what it's made out of. These are the Ulta, by the way. Um, probably not the best shoes to purchase with spring around the corner. Get these instead. These are perfect for uh, spring because they've got that little extra height to keep your feet dry. These are all made with something called Dymatex material, which makes them 100% waterproof, which is cool. I actually have a bright white pair of shoes just like this, which I love and keep clean. And there's nothing like, I don't know, just white sneakers just look super cool. But they are also available in gray. I have a pair of blacks. This is the uh, Stormburst? Stormburst? Stormburst, yes. Grab some of those or the classic weekends. These were one of the first pairs that Vessi actually sent to me in black. And I wore those things for two years. I wore them out. I wore them every day. And eventually they died as shoes that you wear every day constantly are going to do. Fantastic investment, fully waterproof. You can't go wrong with Vessi. They also make a waterproof jacket. They make gloves. Just, uh, I, I, I can't say enough good things. It's the only shoes that you need. It's Vessi. Just go get them. And the only thing I have to say, elevate your spring wardrobe with Vessi's Stormburst shoes. Ah, they did want me to talk about the Stormbursts. I nailed it. Visit Vessi.com slash Blaze for an automatic 15% off your first purchase at checkout. Don't let spring showers keep you indoors. Step out in style, rain or shine. Thank you, Vessi. I love you. The audience love you. It's just beautiful. And now back to today's video. Thus disposing of them counts as murder. If you have any idea how in vitro fertilization works, this basically means that IVF is now illegal in Alabama. But that's a topic for another day. Back to the actual point. Not only is the US not the most litigious country in the world, we're barely in the top five. Woo, okay. I mean, you just got a reputation for it. I'm sure, are there other big countries that beat you? The most definitive numbers I could find were from 2015, but the most litigious country per capita was actually Germany, and by an incredible margin, really. 
Not only are we not the most sue-happy population in the world, but there are in fact penalties for filing frivolous lawsuits. These are obviously only going to be monetary rather than jail time, but it's not uncommon for someone who files a pointless suit to be on the hook for the defendant's legal fees. Big brain. They may also be subject to additional fines as well. Good. So, where does this misconception come from? Why does everyone believe that the US courts are backlogged with a bunch of insane lawsuits by greedy consumers trying to oppress the helpless multi billion dollar corporations? God save those corporations! How will they live? Simply put, it's because that's what the corporations told us was happening, and we were all dumb enough to believe it. I'm not going to pretend that I wasn't fooled as well growing up, and with good reason. Major corporations would pay big money to have media outlets frame stories the way that they wanted, with these baseless lies often being covered as actual news. The goal of this was, of course, to discourage others from filing completely reasonable lawsuits in the future, and it seems to have worked. I don't want to live on this planet anymore. These sorts of civil suits have been steadily declining in volume since the 1990s because who wants to make national news as the greedy old that stole money from those hard-working Walmart executives? <laughs> the, the dripping sarcasm here is... I'm sure the executives of Walmart probably actually do work quite hard, but it is like, compared to the amount of money they make, is like, <laughs> kind of wild. That sounds like a sarcastic comment, but it's sadly true. In the famed McDonald's coffee lawsuit that Danny previously wrote about on this channel, the plaintiff spent the rest of her life as the subject of harassment and ridicule. While that example is the most famous of these lawsuits, the media coverage resulted in many extremely reasonable lawsuits being the subject of constant derision thanks to the public's misunderstanding of the case and the general myth about lawsuits in America. Yeah, I don't know if Kevin's going to cover the McDonald's one now, but because we covered it before, but if you haven't seen it, I'll just wrap it up real quick. The woman... The, the, the commonly understood story is that this woman got some coffee from mcdonald's she burned herself a little bit and then she sues them because the coffee was too hot it's not like that the coffee was insanely hot like to the level that coffee should never be heated up to and it caused like second degree burns all over her legs and so yeah no lawsuit you're goddamn right man sues phone booth company over drunk driver this story actually predates the McDonald's one, going all the way back to 1974, but it didn't become famous until 1986 when President Ronald Reagan was giving a speech on the matter of tort reform. The case had barely been reported on until nine years later when California Supreme Court issued a ruling, and it didn't become nationwide news until Reagan's speech. Reagan used the case of Charles Bigby and Pacific Telephone and Telegraph Company as an example of the outrageous lawsuits in the United States, referring to Charles and the courts as loony. So what happens that night? Well, let me give you Reagan's account first. In California, a man was using a public telephone booth to place a call. An alleged drunk driver careened down the street, lost control of her car, and crashed into the phone booth. Now, it's no surprise that the injured man sued, but you might be startled to hear who he sued, the telephone company and associated firms. Yeah, I mean, when you put it like that, it does sound bad, but I get the feeling that's probably not the whole story, is it? After implying that the California Supreme Court ruled in Charles's favor, Reagan added, I suppose all this might be amusing if such absurd re results only took place occasionally, yet today they have become all but commonplace. Now, to be fair, everything Reagan said about the case was technically true, and I agree, the way the story is described there does sound ridiculous. In fact, it sounds suspiciously ridiculous because it feels obvious that there has to be more to the story than that. You bet there is. Also, the accident had occurred 12 years earlier and sounded like it was resolved. Why then would Reagan refer to the driver as being allegedly drunk? Police have been using breathalyzers since 1939, although back then they were called drunkometers, which is a way better name that we should bring back. There were also blood tests as well, and there's a reasonable chance that the driver in that accident had to go to the hospital. Shouldn't it have been established fact at that point whether or not she was drunk? Well, let's take a look at all of the very important details that were left out of the story. It was the night of November the 2nd, 1974, and Charles had just finished his job as a janitor at City Hall. Custodian, dick! He worked the second shift, so he didn't get out of work until midnight. After leaving, he drove down to a local convenience store to buy a newspaper and a loaf of bread. That bread tasted awful! Then walked out to the payphone to give his girlfriend a call. His girlfriend lived nearby, so it was a nightly ritual for him to call her from the payphone to see if she was awake and DTF <laughs> before heading home from work. <laughs> you said that you were a DTF! Yeah, down to fiancé! The phone booth was located directly next to a six-lane thoroughfare, and during the course of his call, Charles noticed a car start to swerve across lanes. There were several other people in the convenience store parking lot, and they all had time to run out of the way of the oncoming car, including the person in the phone booth on the opposite side of the lot. Charles had time to escape as well, but the door jammed, trapping him inside. 
Yeah, okay, Reagan, that might have been an important detail to mention, maybe. I don't want to. It was a brutal crash, and after being taken to hospital, Charles needed to have his right leg amputated. Now, the left leg required surgery and skin grafts, and he needed a brace for his left leg and a prosthetic for his right. Seeing as how he had a low-paying job for the city, he had to rely on insurance to cover his initial medical treatments. But because he wasn't able to return to work, he also knew that it was only a matter of time before they cancelled his insurance. This is f***ed up, America. This is crazy. Like, healthcare, guys. Healthcare. Healthcare. When that happens, it was time to sue. And as one might expect, his first lawsuits were against the driver and the three bars and restaurants that allegedly overserved her alcohol on that night. What? I'm sorry. It's your responsibility if you get f***ed up. If I go to a bar and get f***ed up, I don't go back there the next day and be like, I am super hungover and it's your fault, Bob. F*** you, Bob. That makes no sense. It's her fault. Why wouldn't you just sue the insurance company that she's with? She drives a car. She has insurance. There'll be insurance for this. No? Of course, while it was obvious to everybody on the scene that the driver had been drunk, technically, there was no proof. Does that matter if there's proof of her being drunk or not? Either way, she crashed her car. Insurance is going to cover injury to someone that she's injured when she crashed her car, even if it's just because she's a shit driver. No blood alcohol tests were conducted, allegedly because police knew that the driver's son was an officer in the LAPD. Oh, for f sake. Even if they hadn't recognized her, she kept a so copy of her son's police ID in her wallet right next to her driver's license, which makes me wonder exactly how often she was trying to get out of DUI arrests. Despite the lack of appropriate testing having been done at the scene, the driver and the bars settled for a total of $25,000, half of which had to be paid by the driver herself. It was a start, but it wasn't a ton of money. Yeah, that's not going to cover those medical bills. You had your leg amputated and you needed a prosthesis. That shit is expensive. That was about three times Charles's yearly salary. Oh, this is happening in the past. Sorry, I was like, three times? What, he makes like 8,000 a year? But he had major medical bills, was unable to return to work for years, and even then only in a diminished capacity, and would now have to endure a lifetime of chronic pain from his injuries. Charles's lawyer referred to the initial settlement as traveling money. It gave them enough to go after the companies with much deeper pockets, and who were absolutely at fault as well. As Charles's lawyer began to investigate the incident, he discovered that there were three major issues of negligence on the part of the phone company. First was the design of the phone booth itself, which was pretty sh the door folded inward like an accordion and didn't have a smooth action, so it wasn't unreasonable for them to foresee a person getting stuck. Second was the location. Pacific Telephone knew that the phone booth being so close to such a busy street wasn't safe, and they knew this because it wasn't even the first time that that exact payphone had been struck. I need you to be able to tell me what's wrong with this without me explaining it verbally. And you just put it back there, you idiots! Allegedly. Just 18 months earlier, another driver crashed into the same phone booth. And that brings us to the final act of negligence, which was that they didn't properly repair the phone booth after it was initially damaged. Not only did Pacific Telephone and its associated entities, who were part of the lawsuit, fail to put up a guardrail between the booth and the street, but they knew the door was broken and didn't bother fixing it. Oh, come on! That's some pretty damning evidence that the phone company shared a legitimate amount of the blame for Charles's injuries. But the courts disagreed. At least initially, Pacific Telephone filed to have the case dismissed by summary judgment. Summary judgment is when the plaintiff and defendant agree on the facts of a case, they just disagree on the verdict that should be issued based on those facts. It's a great way to save money on trial expenses, so long as you believe the judge will rule in your favor based solely on the facts in evidence. Charles's lawyer appealed the summary judgment all the way to the California Supreme Court as referenced by Reagan, but the Supreme Court didn't award Charles any money. All they did was overturn the decision for summary judgment. It didn't mean that Charles suddenly won the case, it just meant that he was entitled to have his case heard by a jury. Of course, that never actually happened because they wound up settling. Money, 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 baby, he's getting paid. While that settlement was for an undisclosed amount, Charles's lawyer said that it was enough for Charles to retire. Yeah, baby. <laughs> but even after this 10-year legal battle, Charles was still only in his early 40s, so he didn't retire. He kept on being a janitor custodian. because he liked working. Honestly, that's probably for the best. Charles had one fake leg, one bad leg, and it was the early 80s, so there was no internet and only three TV channels. I'm not sure what realistic ways there would be to enjoy retirement under those circumstances other than just drinking himself to death. <laughs> it's not very creative, Kevin. <laughs> Jokes on you, I'm into that shit. Although it was the 80s, so maybe cocaine was an option regardless. 
years, this story had been largely had largely flown under the radar for a decade until the state Supreme Court decision to allow Charles to have a trial. Pacific Telephone left a phone booth that they knew had a broken door in a location that they knew was dangerous, and Charles lost a leg thanks to a car that he saw coming but couldn't escape from in time because of said broken door. And yet lawmakers framed Charles as the greedy villain in this story, making this the most talked about frivolous lawsuit in America until the McDonald's coffee incident. It's almost like you can't trust politicians or major corporations to have the public's best interest in mind. But don't worry, you can always trust Blaze Boy to look out for your best interests. And that's why the other lawsuit we're going to talk about today is much more lighthearted with 100% fewer missing limbs. Glad to hear that. Men sue Red Bull for not giving them wings. Bro, this is called a puff. This is called puffery. It's a legal term where it's like an advert is so absurd that there's no reasonable expectation that the consumer would believe it. Like Red Bull literally making you sprout wings and flying. That's insane. It's a puff. Case dismissed. Judge Whistler has spoken. Day very briefly touched upon Red Bull's famous marketing slogan, Red Bull Gives You Wings, in a recent episode, but there wasn't any mention of the lawsuit that followed. Unlike Pacific Telephone and McDonald's, who had to work really hard to get the media to portray their victims' life-altering injuries as a frivolous lawsuit, Red Bull probably didn't have to do a damn thing to get the media to portray the false advertising lawsuit against them as ridiculous. It all went down in 2014, a time when traditional news media was already seen as a relic of the past. Still around though, isn't it? Still got that <laughs> news media? I mean, I, I, I check BBC. I read the news sometimes. It's like a thing. What's wrong with... I, I mean, there's so much trash news, I guess. That's the problem. But there's still good news. There's still really good news. Oh, that's good news! The only thing that mattered was having a clickable headline, and this one wrote itself. Why would reporters go about their due diligence in finding out the nuanced details of the false advertising lawsuit against Red Bull when they could just race to be the first to post man sues Red Bull because he thought it would actually give him wings? This seems like the most obvious example of a frivolous lawsuit ever, as no person in their right mind would believe that an energy drink would literally make wings sprout from their backs. And the names plaintiffs in the class action lawsuit, Benjamin Carruthers, David Wolf, and Miguel Almarez all agreed with that statement. But that wasn't the problem with the advertising campaign. The phrase, Red Bull gives you wings, has two different interpretations. Nobody believed the very fake literal claim that Red Bull would give them wings, but they brought it because of the very real figurative claim that it would. What the f does that mean? I mean, of course it's figurative. It's like got caffeine, it's gonna be like, brrr, it's gonna jazz you up. Like a strong cup of coffee. Red Bull was an energy drink, and the figurative claim that it would give you wings indicated that it would leave a person energized and invigorated. That, the plaintiffs argued, was the lie. Bro, it contains 32 milligrams of caffeine per 100 mils. That, unless you've got like some massive caffeine tolerance, that's gonna give you some energy. At this point, Simon is probably screaming internally, wondering what the hell damages these three would have been suing over. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say so. The answer to that is unjust enrichment. Red Bull had made a promise regarding the energy their drinks would provide, and they demanded a premium price for their product as a result, yet they had failed to deliver on that promise. So basically, it was just three people who just wanted their money back, but also were angry enough to go through the trouble of a class action lawsuit to expose the truth about Red Bull's lies. What lies? I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. And since lead plaintiffs in a class action seem typically get more money than the rest of the class, I'm sure that provided some extra motivation. And best of all, the plaintiffs had science on their side. Not only was it science, it was science so basic that even the most brain-dead jurors could easily understand it. An 8-ounce cup of coffee has 95 milligrams of caffeine in it. An 8.4-ounce can of Red Bull has 77 milligrams of caffeine in it. A bigger serving, yet lower caffeine content, meant that Red Bull was an inferior source of energy, despite costing some anywhere from 2 to 10 times as much. I mean, sure, but crystal meth is probably a superior source of energy, and it's pretty cheap. That doesn't mean you can have a lawsuit over it, does it? Depending on whether you're buying coffee at a drive through or may bring it at home yourself. Okay, fine. But maybe these kids were just overreacting. I mean, can a metaphor, even an extremely clear one, really be false advertising? Maybe. But also maybe not. But Red Bull had gone further than that. On their website, they claimed numerous scientific studies showed that Red Bull improved energy levels and performance in its drinkers. Mm, now, you, now I'm seeing where there's maybe a lawsuit. Oh, you're a lawyer? You're a f lawyer? 
And that claim may have been true, especially if the studies were citing all compared energy levels in those who drank Red Bull with those who drank NyQuil. Yet, despite Red Bull's claim of numerous scientific studies that Red Bull was a superior source of energy demanding a premium price, all reputable studies that could be found showed it was no more effective than coffee. The lawsuit was eventually settled for $13 million. Oh my lord. With every person who had purchased a Red Bull in the previous 12 years entitled to either $10 or two free Red Bull products totaling $15 or less. What the f is going on here? What the f is happening? What the f is happening in this world? Why? No, stop. Stop. This is so silly. They may have settled the case, but they still weren't going to change their slogan. It was iconic, and the company stood behind it. Besides, this was just one legal defeat in Sue Happy America, so it's not like they were going to have to deal with this problem again, or well, so they thought. Two years later, a Canadian man, Michael Attar, filed an identical lawsuit in Canada. He had tried to request compensation as part of the original class action suit, but he was denied because he wasn't a U.S. citizen. Heavens to Gretzky, that was a real chiclet rattler. Because of that, he had to create his own class action lawsuit in Canada, armed with even more evidence. Not only was the caffeine content lower than coffee, but his lawsuit also cited studies that debunked the claims regarding taurine. Taurine is an amino acid that is a common ingredient in energy drinks, but according to the new studies Michael was armed with, it didn't do a goddamn thing to increase energy. Do people think it does? When you buy Red Bull, you're buying it for the caffeine. Simple as that. Michael had the same argument that had prevailed in U.S. court, and he was armed with even more scientific evidence to refute Red Bull's claims. Ironically, new studies from 2023 showed that taurine may have anti-aging properties, at least in worms, mice, and monkeys, but that research wasn't out yet and probably wouldn't have been relevant to this case anyway. Yeah, living longer, or what was it called? Anti-aging is not the same as giving you energy. <laughs> Red Bull was again forced to settle. The terms of the settlement were the same, though this time they only had to pay about $650,000 rather than millions, but two losses in a row was finally enough for the poor little company everybody was picking on. Because the claim was deemed to be false advertising, they changed it from Red Bull gives you wings to Red Bull gives you wings with the two extra eyes. Does that seem like the exact same slogan? Pretty much, yes, but wings with two extra eyes is not a real word with an accepted definition, and as such, its meaning cannot be the basis of a false advertising claim. Well, that may just work, actually. Red Bull have clever lawyers to get that sorted out. On a related note, I'm pleased to announce our new ad campaign, Brain Blaze is 100% guaranteed to leave your Flarborg's feelings scrummed your lessons. Yes, it is. Thanks for watching. It's a frozen embryo! It's not a person